Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's investment webinar with Six.com. I'm Peter Kraut. I'll be your host and moderator. Today's topic is Precious Metals, the Transitory Inflation Enigma, a look back. We have three great panelists with us. We have Daniel Barankin, CEO and founder of Six.com, Rick Van Nieuwenhuis, President and CEO Contango Ore, and Richard Williams, Executive Chairman, Bunker Hill Mining. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Good to be back. So I think uh, the uh, proceed, best, best way to proceed is um, I'd like to kind of set the stage by reviewing what um, we talked about on the last panel with the same group. Uh, this was back at the end of November last year. We all made predictions. I'd like to give a bit of a scorecard on how we did. Um, at the time, the Fed had finally said that they would stop calling inflation transitory. I think that was sort of the big news at the time. Uh, the Fed uh, was saying that it would only raise rates by early 2023 or late 2022. One week later, we were all gathered to discuss our thoughts and um, we addressed whether we thought precious metals would act as a hedge against sky high inflation. And since then, inflation has in fact uh, continued to soar to keep rising. The Fed could no longer avoid um, hiking rates. They did start, in fact, uh, as early as March, and so went quickly from near zero to 2.25, where we are right now. And since December, the S&P is down 11%. 20-year treasuries are down 20%. Gold is up about 1%. Commodities are up about 22%. And we've had two consecutive quarters of negative uh, GDP growth. Q1 was minus 1.6%, Q2 minus 0.9%. And now the Fed is resisting calling this a recession. So um, now for our scorecard, I'll start with uh, some of mine, which is mixed, admittedly. Um, I said I expected that the Fed would raise rates only slowly and to make it to about 1% to 1.5% by late 2022. So I clearly got that wrong. Uh, I did say the markets would sell off slash crash. I think I got that right. I said the Fed would cave and back off. Um, well, I guess that perhaps the jury's out on that, um, at least still right now. Um, I said once the Fed stopped raising rates, the, that precious metals will, would take off. So this is a little interesting one in the sense that um, maybe that's kind of what's starting to happen now, in the sense that uh, perhaps the, the market is starting to price in uh, the end or near end of uh, rate hikes. And I said that we would enter a period of stagflation, weak growth, high inflation, two quarters of negative GDP and continuously rising inflation. Um, since then, it uh, looks like I may have gotten that one right. So now uh, Daniel's scorecard. Um, Daniel talked about how an increase in the money supply over the previous years had found its home in the S&P. A lot of tech stocks, Tesla was one great example, and that the US especially, but uh, I think we could argue much of the developed world, the cost of living had gone down, but wealth inequality had widened. And the implications were that uh, people uh, who benefited um, were actually mostly the ones who had participated in stocks. Consumer spending had gone down, um, but that we, had to, uh, we should expect to see more of that. And the implication, uh, for equities was that when people could afford less, they'd start to spend less, companies would start to miss earnings, suffer lower profits. Um, Daniel, you certainly got that right. Stocks and bonds are way down. Precious metals and base metals were undervalued relative to the money supply, and you clearly got that right as well, and expected that uh, these, this, these sectors, precious metals and base metals, would um, attract money, and we got, uh, you got that right. We've seen both uh, the metals do well and the, um, the shares in some of those companies at least uh, start to do quite well as well. Rick, uh, you talked about a global push to a non-carbon future um, on all levels of government and that this would be good for metals, uh, especially base, uh, but as well um, things like copper, silver, gold. You got that right. Those metals have held up. Gold should perform as an ultimate hedge against inflation. That certainly is right. Uh, that in the 1970s stagflation period, that was driven by the oil crisis and that um, we saw high oil prices and energy prices, double-digit inflation, 
um, and that we'd likely see a repeat. We're certainly very close to that now, nearly as close as we could get to double digit inflation, but that this time the energy choices were self-imposed um, and that we should expect more money printing to pay for this and that oil would continue to be needed and oil has soared. So you also clearly got that right as well. Richard, your turn. So mining stocks, you called them undervalued uh, relative to inflation and uh, to the um, inflation potential, clearly got that right. Increased demand uh, for metals to refurbish the world's power system. You talked about how COP26 um, certainly um, pointed towards an increase in base metals, and that would be well beyond the current supply. That would be very inflationary for producers. We saw lots of base metals absolutely soar and their producers soar that you saw that silver was an industrial metal and its split characteristic um, would uh, support silver. Um, you saw the need to factor in ESG requirements. Today's complexities were different over the 70s and that we'd be entering a new super cycle for base metals. And um, at least so far, I would say um, since then, uh, that certainly looks right as well. So uh, overall, none of us did, did too badly. Overall, I think uh, quite well, but uh, let's look forward. And on that basis, uh, now that we've looked back, uh, what I guess the first point to look at is what's the outlook for inflation, uh, debt, interest rates, and recession at this point. So that's a bit of a larger question, um, but I would like to get everyone's uh, thoughts on uh, that sort of overall macro outlook. Daniel, why don't we start with you? Certainly. So my view is that given the creation of capital and money and, and currency in particular that's entered into the system, my view is that there's now a lot of folks that have this capital and have this ability to purchase assets with a recognition that the value of their capital is very quickly going away. And so the consequence of that is that those folks who have that capital are going to be trying to purchase assets and do so and put it in places that can be a safeguard against inflation. The challenge that they have is knowing that the value of the thing that they have is depreciating, people are less willing to accept it. And so a lot of the macroeconomic conditions that we've seen over the last six months especially Fed, Fed policies, things of that sort, have actually, in the context of great uh, rising inflation, made the dollar itself more valuable in the sense for those who don't have it desperately need access to it. We're seeing, for example, throughout the world where debt is denominated in the U.S. dollar as interest rates are rising, more folks who already had a scarcity of capital to pay and to, uh, to offset that debt need even greater access to it. And so what we're seeing is a pretty significant shift in capital where on the surface, everyone can see that the value of the U.S. dollar, the value of any currency printed by any government is declining and evaporating in real time in very close to double digit numbers by official stats and by shadow stats. You can see it's much, much greater. And in your own life, you can see that's much, much greater. While at the same time, we're seeing an increase in the demand, especially among those that need to repay debts to go and run and, and get that dollar. And so what I see unfolding right now is a process whereby as debtors are forced to go and make payments on their debt, otherwise they have defaults, otherwise they lose the underlying assets that the debt initially was used to purchase or create, there's going to be a slow transition where the dollar itself still has that value because people need access to it. Once that process is, com is completed, where those who have the dollar no longer need it because they're able to purchase assets and give it to those who desperately need the dollar. That's when I expect there to be a fundamental reassessment of the situation, being the catalyst for gold, silver, commodities, and everything else. Really, the view that I have is such that those who have are leveraging this entire process to get even more. And once they're able to offload the asset, and in this case, the currency, into folks that desperately need it, and they're subsequently able not to have it anymore, that's when this readjustment happens. And I expect this process to continue, certainly in the near term, and probably into the second part of this this coming year. Well, thanks for that. Uh, very interesting thoughts. Um, Rick, what do you think about how um, what the outlook is as far as your concern for inflation, for debt, and interest rates, and the risk of recession? Yeah, well, I, I think we're probably already in a recession. Uh, we've now decided to redefine what a recession is. I guess it's not two quarters anymore, back to back. Uh, um, so I, I think the uh, the Fed basically is is doing its job. Probably some some would say a little too little too late. 
Um, but they, you know, they, they have gotten with the program. They don't have Paul Volcker in charge or, or someone like a Paul Volcker who's going to take the, the hard steps. Um, so it's, I think the jury's still out as to, you know, how aggressive the Fed gets, whether they start, um, the more Wall Street starts whining, uh, are they going to, are they going to back off? Uh, that will send very confusing messages and the Fed will lose credibility if they do that. They, they've got to either stay the course uh, or they lose credibility, in my opinion. Um, beyond that, uh, it's not just the Fed. It's not just up to the Fed. The Fed only has a few tools. It's You have to point the finger at Congress. And they just passed the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, which couldn't be more poorly named, uh, $700 billion. And uh, it's supposed to be paid by taxes. Um, most of those taxes are on manufacturing and oil. Uh, so you know damn well the consumer's going to pay those. So um, that's inflationary. Um, I think the drug piece of the, of the legislation is probably the smartest piece. That's, that's been long overdue, uh, where you know, Medicare uh, can buy, uh, you know, use its, its might to buy, uh, negotiate better prices. Um, but the whole climate aspect of the, of the bill, which is a big part of it, is totally inflationary. Um, subsidizing industries, uh, 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 solar and, and wind specifically, uh, and giving everybody who buys a Tesla 7,500 bucks back as a tax rebate, those, those, aren't, those aren't fair to lower income folks. Um, so I see, the, I, I, I see Congress not doing its job. And obviously the vote was, uh, was right down right down party lines and, and our fate is in the hand of hands of uh, someone like Camilla Harris, which scares the crap out of me. So um, that's, I don't see anything as, as change in Congress yet. Uh, maybe in November we'll get a different Congress and, and maybe some, some, some things can happen that aren't going to be inflationary, but I see inflation continuing. If we continue to print money, the Fed's got, uh, the Fed, basically affects Wall Street. It doesn't affect Main Street. Um, and I think a lot of people get confused on the economy. The economy is not Wall Street. It's, it's everybody, everybody who goes out and buys something in the grocery store. And when they got to figure out whether they can put gas in the tank or buy food, that's not a good situation. We have a strong dollar now because we have a weak euro and the Chinese have, have this zero COVID policy that is I think is probably just another uh, currency manipulation tool uh, to lower the, the value of the yuan so they can buy, uh, sell their stuff cheap, cheap overseas and, and be competitive, remain competitive. Um, they've got cheap oil from Russia now with, because uh, nobody else is buying Russian oil. Um, so it's, uh, it's an interesting setup there's been two main events that have occurred since uh, we last met, and that's the, the uh, Russia invading uh, the Ukraine and China uh, having this implementing this zero COVID policy or continuing this uh, zero COVID policy. And that has led, in my opinion, that's led to a strong dollar. And we don't have a strong dollar. We all know we don't have a strong dollar. We just, it's just stronger than all the other weak currencies. And um, so it's a race. It's uh, it's a race to the bottom that we're. I guess we're winning, as as, uh, as you might say. So I don't see. Uh, I don't see that we've done anything different. Um, governments apparently will continue to spend to achieve the green new economy. Um, I think uh, it's amazing to me that uh, Biden would fly all the way to Riyadh to ask the Saudis to, to <laughs> produce more oil when he could have just. We could have just, you know, jumped on a plane and gone to Houston and where this country can produce oil with, you know, lower methane and lower CO2 emissions than any other country in the world. But yet he goes to Riyadh. Um, we still haven't had zero discussion in the media or from the White House on how we're actually going to achieve the uh, green new future with without having mining. Uh, that's the mining hasn't even entered the picture yet. So there's a lot of things that are still yet to come, I think. Um, and hopefully in November, uh, things change in Congress, because I think that's the real, in the U.S. at least, that's the real perpetrator of the, the inflationary policies. 
I'll right. start. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Richard, your thoughts, inflation, debt, interest rates, recession. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I think you know, both Rick and Daniel have covered um, most of the issues. So I'll, in some respects, they're going to be summarizing. But to be to be clear from my perspective, I think the situation of stagflation, which was debated a lot a few months ago, is now absolutely real. And I think rather like we spoke about inflation not being transitory, I think this period of stagflation is going to endure, um, and particularly in what we characterize as the West. Now, endure for how long? Um, well, it's going to be interesting, isn't it? And linking into Rick's point about politics plays its part here um, and the limitations of what the Fed can do or over in the UK, my old hometown, what the, um, uh, what the central bank can do there too. All of these things are going to change. Uh, and so I think stagflation um, uh, is not going to be a 12-month phenomenon. It's going to be uh, a significant one for a period of time. Driven as it is by the supply shocks um, in terms of uh, oil prices, but other supply shocks, um, and and you, Peter, uh, Rick quite rightly pointed to the uh, war in Ukraine as being um, the real catalyst for that on the back of the COVID supply shocks. And so we're seeing some interesting things in, in, in the mining industry. I mean, um, people talk about the uh, wage to price spiral or the price to wage spiral, depending on which way you're looking at it. Um, I'm certainly hearing rather like one did in one's old life at Barrick in Argentina, some pretty active moves by the late, not not at bunker, but around the industry um, for uh, for price uh, increase, wage increases to follow price increases. And we're going to see that. And then in another business I'm involved with, um, Trevally, it's been quite interesting what's happened to the zinc price because you've got this price increase as a result of supply shrinkage where the cost of power has gone up so much that the smelters can't afford to take through low-grade ore. So downstream of that, you end up with a zinc supply constraint which drives up the price of zinc. So as we know, and it's impossible, I find, to... Uh, to simplify these complex uh, relationships in a, in, in a short brief. I think we're seeing this going to continue. On a policy side, yes, you're seeing um, demands for tighter monetary policy. Uh, but at the same time, look at the UK, uh, a wish to uh, offer the population growth and sunlit uplands. Uh, that's a pretty classic um, political fork in the road. And 2024, with both US elections and UK elections being um, I don't know, um, uh, and it, it's sort of a classic example of where this fork in the road is going to play out. We're going to see that happening. Uh, Rick's very good point about a def, you know, the devaluations against the US dollar on average around about 9% for other currencies, again, plays into the uh, inflationary uh, issues um, in, in, certain, in certain assets in certain places. And then there's also this demand at the moment, which is adding into this or this issue, which is adding into th this general situation of so-called deglobalization, a wish to move away from a dependency on uh, Chinese supply chains in terms of inputs or Chinese markets in terms of place to sell. This is my view is mainly talk uh, because the practicalities of changing that are exceedingly expensive and politically very difficult practically to, to, to move. Although Rick's point about uh, getting more domestic oil versus foreign oil uh, is a very useful counter to that. But in a general sense, um, what I'd say is over the next 12 months or so, extending through the electoral year of 2024, um, this challenge of stagflation is sadly going to be what we're going to be living through and how it affects our businesses, I guess, is subsequent questions. But Peter. OK, well, thank you for that. Um, let's uh, move to the idea of the implications that uh, all of this has for precious and base metals. Uh, Daniel, why don't we start with you and see uh, if you can give us um, your thoughts on um, how you see that potentially playing out. Certainly. I think within looking at the last two decades, we've seen that most of the value on the stock market has very much been the intangible values largely driven by technology, by software, by innovation. And a lot of this, these past two decades is something that I would describe as 
the post-scarcity era, where really energy was cheap and abundant, innovation was happening everywhere and blossoming, and international trade and prosperity was free. And to that end, we benefited significantly from the peace dividend over the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, because we had secure supply chains, we had open trade, we were able to really focus on this intangible economy. And to that end, if you look at the S&P 500 composition over, the la over that period, even the last 50 years, you'll see that there's been this significant shift where most of value is captured in the intangibles. The question I look at is, will the next two decades look more similar to the previous two decades or dissimilar? And my view, based on everything that Richard and Rick and, and yourself have said today, I think there's a lot of compelling reasons to think that the future will deviate quite substantially from the past. We're seeing the rise of a new world power that genuinely threatens the United States and the hegemony. We're seeing this transition towards a global desire, especially among many countries, which has always been there, but that's now a bit more practical to achieve, of a multipolar world. And we're seeing the regionalization of supply chains, the supply routes, that, to Rick and Richard's point, is already producing dividends in the form of cheaper oil for those that choose to side in the case of, for instance, the China and the Russia relationship. And so what that means creates this context when when we look at real assets or tangible assets, things like precious metals, things like base metals, we have supply itself being split in half in a pretty significant way, where you can no longer take gold or resources from everywhere, you have to be regionally. And so that itself introduces a supply constraint. In addition to that, you also don't have necessarily the security or even the ability to make high risk investments. And so the sorts of investments that are going to be made and the places they're being made itself slows down. And so whenever looking at something like what happens to price in the context of any commodity, where it takes resources, energy, labor, capital, et cetera, to go and produce it, we're going to see all of that increase quite substantially. And I think that the only resolution to that is high prices. And so to that end, I think that across the entire commodity sector, we're going to be seeing a difficulty of accessing those commodities due to that narrowing scope of supply. And subsequently, the price of everything is going to increase. And so to that uh, initial point of looking at the last two decades being characterized as post-scarcity, I think the next two decades are going to be characterized by return towards scarcity. And so as sad as I am about that, I think the only inevitable conclusion of that is going to be higher prices. And then that affects everything downstream. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, great comments. Um, I guess, uh, would it be fair to say that uh, investors need to be careful uh, and weary of uh, something we call recency bias? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So so just for anyone who's maybe not familiar with that, it basically means that you need to be careful uh, that you don't necessarily expect that what is what lies ahead is um, very or, or too similar to what we've just lived, uh, just because that's what we're comfortable, that's what we, we've seen, that's what we're used to, uh, that things can change uh, and they can change dramatically. Um, I think um, there were some comments uh, by Ray Dalio, who's uh, behind the, the Bridgewater uh, hedge fund, the world's largest hedge fund. Uh, he made comments uh, to that effect uh, sometime in the last, perhaps uh, maybe six to 12 months. And uh, he's someone that, um, that certainly knows, uh, knows investing and uh, someone to watch, perhaps, in terms of uh, a big thinker. Uh, Rick, uh, your thoughts on what um, you know, some of these trends that we've just talked about could mean for precious metals and base metals? Yeah, well, I'll, maybe I'll stick with gold and, and let Richard talk more to the base metals. But uh, I, I think you know, uh, the inflationary environment, I think we're seeing uh, gold continue to move up uh, over time. You know, it, it did uh, retrench here. It, uh, all the metals retrenched uh, uh, as around, um, I think, May 8th, around in May, they started to really uh, fall down. Gold, gold sagged, silver went, uh, went off hard, copper went off hard, oil uh, uh, also uh, came off a bit. So I think we're um, I think we're still seeing a very uh, inflationary environment will continue. I, I think the stagflation is going to stay for a long time um, uh, because if, if we keep moving towards the green economy, it just it requires spending a lot of money. You, you, you just don't get there and it requires a lot of metal. So I think it will be good for metals in the long term. I think, you know, recessionary pressures in the, in the short term uh, will certainly affect uh, uh, probably base metals more than, than precious. Um, I think 
what were the, the 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 impact of inflation on building new mines is probably the biggest uh, area of concern for investors. And I mean, we've seen that with uh, the, from the big companies of Newmont uh, to the mid tiers, uh, IM Gold uh, and Core, all all having to report. Hey, you know, our costs have, have gone up 20, 30, 40 percent. Uh, so they're not small numbers. Um, you know, to put my own plug in here, I think that's one of the advantages that we have at Contango is that because we're using an already existing facility that Kinross has it operates at Fort Knox, we are seeing the same inflationary pressures, but we're just, we're not we're not spending as much capital because we're not building a mill, we're not building a tailings facility. So, you know, whereas Kinross's guidance uh, a year ago was you know 100 110 million dollars of capital uh you know now it's more like 150. so um that's you know it's the same increase it's just we're we're, we're starting from a much smaller base since we're not building a, a tailing facility and mill so um i think that's that's certainly the concern that you have uh from the investors in the market today and and i think why uh the juniors in particular are, are still uh, suffering uh, from a lack of, uh, of investment or a, a lack of um, uh, a concern about what you know what what's the future hold and and, a, and a sort of a restriction on capital right now. There's a lot of money sitting on the sidelines. Um, I think that will change because uh, you know we need these metals, and uh, at some point in time, uh, the politicians will wake up to that fact. Um just a couple of comments I'd like to make. Uh, one is that uh, I've seen the same thing too as I, as I follow uh, mining companies uh, in the last uh, maybe three months or so when I read um, press releases and uh, I look at uh, quarterly um, quarterly numbers, both production and uh, financials, I am seeing similar comments. Either they're talking about how, yes, they've seen uh, price inflation affect uh, their operations, or at the very least, they're saying that for now, they've kind of escaped it, but they absolutely see it coming uh, going forward over the next several quarters. So absolutely, uh, I don't see, uh, you know, I, I would not disagree with any of that. It's absolutely what I've been seeing as well. Another point is that um, just this morning, I was reading an article um, in mining.com about how uh, gl uh, battery metals, um, you know the international energy agency is forecasting that we could need we could we would potentially need to um up our output by about 10 times for battery metals just to reach 2030 forecasts in terms of uh, usage and and build out so i mean these are just incredible numbers you can't help but think that we're gonna fall short uh, i mean i just can't imagine otherwise but that almost doesn't matter <laughs> you know the the expectations and the push towards this is so big that even if we fall short the demand's going to be so so overwhelming that this entire space should should uh, absolutely do very well so anyways those those are just sort of my uh, two cents in in this uh, in that area and uh, and on your on your thoughts uh, richard um if you like rick was suggesting if you'd like to perhaps adjust um um, address the base metals aspect of, uh, of that uh, of that outlook for uh, for metals. Sure. Um, uh, and again, I, I get the benefit going last because I tend to sort of resonate what others have said. But but the, the the general demand picture for base metals driven in it is by, I think, two things. Um, investment in uh, energy transformation um and investment in infrastructure with the second being a typical lever that governments pull whether they're keynesian or not uh to try and buy their way out of recession how they afford that is a central banker problem that we've we've spoken about but it's highly unlikely uh, going forward that you're not going to see government spending an awful lot on infrastructure the government that will drive this the most of course is china that has declared that it wishes to transform its energy system. So the so the biggest gorilla in the room, uh, who's got the biggest power and spending power to do that is China, and that will drive quite a lot of both infrastructure um, demand as well as power transition demand. 
so I think on the demand side, anybody uh, in base, um, or as we transition at Bunker between base and we have silver, um, looks on the demand side being pretty strong. Um, on the supply side, however, you do have this. Um, I'll touch on the constraints that, that Rick and, and Daniel have mentioned at the moment, uh, access to capital, uh, permitting challenges, and then this new or current uh, inflationary environment. So on an asset by asset um, basis, if you're an investor, you're going to want to have a look at what the underlying structural cost base is and how it can endure uh, what's going to be an inflationary period in real terms, but in perceived terms. And Rick's reference to the fact that he's leveraging off existing infrastructure is one very good example uh, of, of what makes that uh, company different. Uh, we, of course, are doing the same. Um, so we can also mention that. But we feed off the Pacific Northwest power grid, hydro uh, investments made in the 1930s that gives us 6.5 cents per kilowatt hour. Or here in Ontario, if you look at the power consumption, the majority of it is nuclear as a result of decisions made in the 1970s. So the reason I mention all that is when we're looking at the supply side realities, which assets are going to make money, it's going to be dependent upon structural investments made 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, and I think that that's where um, the, the generalities here become quite distorting, but where the specifics, to go to Daniel's point about real assets, investing in the right ones that have got the right structural cost base, feeding products into a growing market, it is where investors should be looking. Um, easy to say, of course, but we think with all that information, but when you are tracking, at which people are now, including me and Peter, you clearly doing it too, people's Q2 announcements from the big companies to the smaller companies, looking through what their cost projections are in and into the structural basis of those or whether they're transitory uh, gives you some clues as to which assets are going to maintain their margins the best uh, over this period of time. Um, producers versus developers, there's different things to look at, but but I've made that general point. Peter? Yeah, thanks for that, Richard. I have a question for you, Richard. If you can if you can think of a, of a, uh, of a government that is not uh, Keynesian, I'd like you to send me uh, <laughs> or a central bank. Yeah, I'd like you to send me uh, your your list because I've been thinking about that as you were as you were speaking, and I couldn't come up with any for some reason. No, indeed. And can one of, one of the challenges we have doctrinally, it, it, and you know, again, I'm sympathetic to this. Of course, is government intervention is in general sense seen as a bad thing because it creates inefficiencies, but go government in inactivity. Or, or, or lack of focus is equally bad. So if you're in the business now of trying to incentivize um, investment in critical metals, just use that as one thing, you kind of look around the world and say, well, which government are really doing it? Or are we just relying on um, the, the currently and understandably stressed private capital markets to, uh, uh, to jump in? And, and you are seeing some governments moving to encourage uh, um, build other infrastructure that could work, but nothing, you know, really rapid in this area. And and so you're right. <laughs> they they often are Keynesian in terms of throwing money into the economy, but it's not necessarily as focused as it should be. Look how disappointing in real terms uh, all those statements made in Glasgow uh, with respect to turning into real projects are. But virtually none. And and again, I'm probably you know rightly there'll be some exceptions to that general point but there doesn't appear to be anything really meaningful happening well yeah absolutely and uh, i do think that uh, you know a couple of the points you made that i think are worth highlighting and and perhaps for uh, people interested in, in investing in the in the space uh, metals mining energy etc uh, that two two of the big things uh, or takeaways uh, considerations are, as you mentioned, l perhaps to look for companies that have um, that benefit from large sunk costs, existing yeah. infrastructure, and and low access and, and access to low energy costs. Those yeah. could be uh, major advantages for uh, for the companies that uh, can leverage them. Yeah. Um, so so perhaps let's let's jump to. Um, the next point, which would be, um, what uh, is the current value proposition in mining stocks? Daniel, do you have some thoughts on that? Absolutely, I do. 
So my view is that I think the mining sector as a whole and the primary resource sector as a whole has been probably and arguably the most vilified sector for multiple generations. I know my younger brother, who's a generation Z, they want nothing to do with it and they have a very strong aversion to it. Um, they don't think about it at all. But when they do think about it, it's always in the context of negative press and PR. My generation as millennials have been trained against it as we move towards ESG, things of that sort. My parents and to an extent my grandparents have also moved away from that. And looking at that, you know, the question becomes what happens without those resources? And to what extent do we rely on them? And to what extent will we rely on them? And increasingly, we can see that we rely on them very heavily and that the benefit of these resources, especially the abundance of them, means that people are able to improve their socioeconomic conditions. There's a very strong causal relationship, for example, between the low cost of energy and the ability of people to rise in socioeconomic mobility. It turns out when things are cheaper to produce, you can go and create more gains. As a result, you can sell, you can create businesses, small and large alike. And so there's all of these downstream benefits. And so looking at the metals and mining sector and resource sector as a whole, what's clear is that there has been this very stark narrative that this is villainry. As a consequence of that narrative, there has been significant underinvestment. And if you look at the supply side, there hasn't been any significant increase on the supply side by way of discoveries or increases, even to meet the projections that were stated earlier, for instance, for 2030, which is in the near term. We look even further in terms of the rising number of people that are going to want to live, like how you do in throughout Europe, how you do throughout North America, especially in places like Africa, in Asia, elsewhere, the demand just rises. And so we're faced in a situation where you have this sector that's been underinvested. It's been underinvested strategically because it's been villainized and you have rising demand. And then looking at it in the context of everything discussed earlier in terms of supply chain issues, geopolitics, the breakdown of trust and the ability even to transact in a common currency, that itself is becoming uh, something we cannot even for, fully take for granted anymore. And we're seeing the emergence of alternative ways of transactions and commerce. What's clear to me is that this represents one of the most significant asymmetrical upside opportunities of any sector worldwide at any time. And so looking at the metals and mining sector in particular, I'm remarkably bullish. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I want to move on to to Rick uh, to get your comments as well, but I do want to point out that uh, for viewers, if uh, you'd like to submit some questions, you can do that in the uh, chat uh, section and we'll uh, try to address those um, in a little bit. Um, Rick, your thoughts, the current value proposition in mining stocks. Yeah, I, uh, I appreciate what uh, what Dan was saying. I think they're, they're spot on, and it's uh, it is generational, and uh, um, that that will probably change as people really actually do make the connection of of where the green energy future is going to come from. Um, I think it's amazing to me that in the United States, uh, the list of critical metals doesn't include the most critical metal, which is copper. Um, and that sort of just kind of frames it for me. It's like there's, there's, and maybe that list was put together politically, but uh, but still, it just it tells you that the politicians don't have a clue still. Um, so you know, for all those same reasons, I'm incredibly bullish on all the metals uh, for say the next generation because this this transition, it is a transition to a green economy. It's not going to happen overnight. We can't get rid of oil tomorrow. Um, and we vilified oil as well, and, and uh, uh, very much so. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very uh, very bullish on on, on gold because I, I think this whole process is going to be very inflationary, and uh, for very different reasons, as we talked about uh, nine months ago, uh, when we had you know six six point something percent uh, inflation, and now we have you know nine something percent. Uh, that was that's the, not the shadow number. That's the official number. That's a 50 percent increase. And uh, as I recall, you, Peter, pointing out that, you know, 9 percent was really 14 percent. Well, that means that sorry, 6 percent was really 14 percent and 9 percent means that's 21 percent. <laughs> so yeah. those are big numbers. And we're certainly seeing that in the industry. So I, I think those the shadow numbers are actually more accurate uh, of what 
what people actually experience when they go to the grocery store or when they try to go build a mine. Um, but all that's very positive for, for metals. Um, and, but it's, it, it will be challenging for the junior, uh, for the junior companies to come up with the capital because, because people are going to be afraid of what is the real capital necessary to build it. And I, I think Richard's points on, uh, established infrastructure and, and especially power, because now, now it can only just be power. It needs to be green power. Right. So if your mind is sitting on, on the grid that's powered by coal, not cool. So, um, yeah, it, we, we, we've made the world a little more complicated. Uh, but again, this transition is going to be multi-generational, in my opinion, yeah. which Thanks. is good for metals. Thanks for that. Richard, your thoughts? Sure. On the mining is a value proposition. There was a Financial Times article the other day um, behind multiple paywalls that basically referred to uh, Glencore's um, results recently saying miners benefit from the war more than the military. What it really went was the mining stocks are doing better than defense stocks uh, as a result of the Ukrainian war. Um, and that's as a result of the extraordinary dividends that come from their exposure to coal. Uh, in other words, their ability to provide scarce resources into a global economy that will pay for them uh, is what makes Glencore stand out as a as a and his investment proposition. Now that analog would apply to other mining um, assets too. Uh, if you believe that we are going into a general situation where global demand for metals is going to exceed supply, uh, which is what we, we believe in. Uh, the point about understanding the structural differences between each asset, which each investor need, needs to do, is also um, exceedingly important. But what's interesting, I find, Peter, is we look back to the last, it wasn't the last period of global stagflation, but one of the most well-known periods in the 1970s. Um, what also happened in the 1970s, not just a result of the oil price shocks, but look in the United States, the 1969 Environmental Protection Act, 72 clean air, 74 clean water. It wasn't just over that, those three years, there were a number of laws that came in. So you ended up with not just stagflation, but you ended up with a whole bunch of new environmental demands placed on mining uh, that really created some significant challenges. It shut down hard rock mining, actually, in, in most of the Western United States. The issue today is not the same. We've got a demand for um, in green practices or ESG practices, but based on bedrock laws that were set up 40 years ago. And actually, the mining industry has adjusted over those 40 years to the point at which its ESG practices in the main, not everywhere, but in the main, are way advanced um, from what they were before. But Daniel's point about there being this perception lag in, 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 in certain areas of, of, of the world, certain generations, is yet to flow its way through. So I'd say that actually um, one of the reasons mining stocks are undervalued uh, at the moment is because the investment community hasn't understood this demand supply imbalance. And secondly, there is this perception that mining stocks aren't ESG friendly, which, again, there is a perception issue that everybody has to work through. But what I'd say is that would be worked through as a necessity. Look at Glencore's investment proposition, but also in terms of sort of practical, real uh, work that mining leadership is doing on real assets, providing scarce metal to a world that needs it. So again, I, you know, I wouldn't be in mining if I wasn't bullish. Um, but I think our particular circumstances today in this stagflation is different to what they were in the 1970s, because those environmental laws were passed back then. And it's taken some time for us to catch up. But we have caught up in the main. Okay, well, thank you. Let's do for now, at least one more uh, topic, and then we can perhaps jump to a few questions from uh, from viewers. Uh, so the next question would be, uh, let's start with you again, Daniel. Um, have the mining stocks, have they bottomed? What is the near and midterm risk for them? So I'd say yes. I think my view is that generationally mining stocks have been dramatically underpriced. The challenge is bottomed in what timeline? You know, I look at the metals and mining sector as not something that you day trade or something that you have a short term conviction for. I think if you look at even any highly volatile sector, 
within the short term, there's a tremendous amount of noise. And I think we've seen a lot of that noise uh, even now. If we're looking at the Fed, re, Fed's recent announcement, technology companies are doing very, very well. My view is I don't think people think technology companies are now much better than they were a few days ago prior to the announcement. I think very much there's that short-term momentum play. And out of the pursuit of short-term profit, a lot of investment is flowing into that sector. Similarly, I think that's the exact same reason why investment hasn't yet flowed fully into the metals and mining sector. It's not a short-term momentum play. And so the view that I have is that the way to truly create generational wealth is by looking at things that are going to be true across long time horizons. And I think what's clear in the metals and mining sector is that along any time horizon you look at that, let's say exceeds three years or four years, what you see is that it's staring you right in the face. The obvious need for people to live a higher quality of life than their parents did. The connection between that quality of life and energy abundance, resource abundance, and the relationship between that abundance and scarcity or its opposite. And so in that context, I think that metals and mining companies in particular, as well as the underlying commodities themselves, are deeply undervalued within that timeline. On a shorter term timeline, I also do think that we have, to an extent, bottomed. I can still see a lot. The market is very much still driven by Fed actions. I think at the point where the market stops responding to what the Federal Reserve is doing, that's the point where its legitimacy is completely lost. And whether we get to that point at any time in the future, that remains, you know, I, I make no comment on that at this point. What's clear, however, is that over the long term, I think there's a lot of opportunity in the metals and mining space. And I think that the recent price action and the result of the current economic situation means that many of the entry points are very, very favorable. Okay, thank you. I think that uh, we will certainly, perhaps that will be part of, uh, if we do a, um, a revisit in the next six months, we can uh, address that. <laughs> we can address that point. That should be interesting. Rick, your thoughts. Have um, the uh, mining stocks, have they bottomed? What is the sort of near and midterm risk? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if they've bottomed yet. I think, uh, you know, the, the, the fear of recession or the... Uh, capitulation that we're in a recession or whatever, however that plays out. Um, I, I think that's still probably going to weigh on, on mining stocks and availability and access to capital. I think it's going to be uh, particularly uh, difficult for the junior sector, the exploration sector, the development sector in general. Um, and I, I think as a result of that, there's probably going to be a significant amount of consolidation, which I actually think will be very good for the industry. I think we have way too many damn companies out here chasing too few dollars and uh and it's hard for investors to you know sort of distinguish between this story and that story and um and and you know select uh select you know what are their what are the best things to invest in so i think consolidation will be a result of uh, this next uh, phase here over the next uh, year and i think that'll be a very good thing for the industry okay Thank you. I'd like to uh, remind uh, viewers once again that uh, if they have questions, so please submit them in the uh, in the chat. Um, Richard, your thoughts on have the um, have the mining stocks bottomed, and are we? What is the near and midterm risk? Um, I, it's very hard to call the bottom, isn't it, everybody? But uh, <laughs> um, I, I'd rather hope it, it's going to come in close at some point. Um, but I'd say the near term risks are. Um, uh, you know, obviously the inflation that we've spoken about, which is impacting OPEX and CAPEX and et cetera. Um, uh, but also uh, Rick's very good point about access to capital. Um, an, an anecdote for that, um, you, you know, you, it happens at this time of year, of course, marketing in New York uh, over August is, is uh, a difficult thing to do. Uh, but I heard this anecdote of one of the large gold mining companies for, I'll save their blushes, um, a multi-billion dollar company went into New York the other day trying to set up 12 meetings with institutional investors and only managed to book five. And so there is at the moment this sort of fear, I think, in a general sense about making investment decisions. But we're yet to see um, this realization that we're promoting here, uh, that mining stocks are undervalued and there's a huge value play here. Um, and, and so what you're seeing as mining stocks to those that are in production large are, are trying to, um, you know, demonstrate their yield potential. So lots of dividend and share buyback and so on to attract people into them. Um, the, the concerns that long term investors have with that is it can crowd out 
uh, essential investment in their assets over the long term. But that's a that's that's a normal normal thing to sort of look at. Um, um, but I think not enough capital, too many companies leads us to um, consolidation being a driver. Uh, easier said than done, mind you. Um, but it's certainly it, it's certainly going to be a factor. So into those senses, when you're looking at, at the biggest risk and pitfalls, is you know pick your assets carefully, um, because if you pick the right asset, there's a very good chance it, it could become part of a larger company, uh, or there's also a fair chance that it'll get the capital required uh, to advance itself. Uh, but but again, if you're if you're jumping into mining stocks, wanting to see a rapid turnaround over a 12 month time period, you, you, you may yet to have, have, have discovered that it takes a little bit longer than that. I'm not patronizing anybody. We've all been around the block too many times. Um, it, it, you know, you're looking for real value that's generated over a, a, a real time frame. And, and, and I think this is this is kind of where we are. Um, the bottom can't be much further away, I, I suppose I say, Peter. So whether you're entering now, whether you're entering in six or nine months time, the general prognosis that we're talking about will be the same. You might okay, thank that. you. Richard, since we're, uh, you know, we've got uh, your mic on, um, why don't we deal with one of the questions from a, a viewer? Uh, it's addressed to you, but I'm sure Rick will have some thoughts as well. If metals prices continue to be depressed with the fear of worldwide recession uh, lingering, how will that affect uh, Bunker going forward with its ramp up, um, the risk of cutting back on certain expansion, et cetera? Okay, in terms of, there's a couple of elements on that. We, we have some advantages and Rick has the same in that we're leveraging off existing infrastructure. So if, if you're thinking of basic business principles, you know, we're doing marginal investment on a vast amount of sunk cost. Um, we also have the advantage of being already connected to Pacific Northwest power. We don't at the moment have enough power uh, facilities for what we need. But in working with Avista, our partners, uh, we're solving that. Uh, we bought uh, a secondhand plant uh, um, off, uh, off tech recently uh, to, again, leverage off their sunk cost. And we got that at a discount. But anybody in mining knows one, one plant doesn't necessarily work in one place as well as it does in another place. So we're having to optimize that through our, our, um, our, our ongoing process uh, to ensure that when we do declare to the market what our plan is with respect to our processing uh, solution, it's as efficient as it can be. Um, I, I won't you know, obviously break any rules by declaring anything now, but, but within a month or so, uh, uh, you'll see all of that uh, come clear to the market. In terms of other costs, uh, again, we're doing underground development at the moment, linking some of our um, our areas, working with a local contractor. Uh, and although over the long term, none of those contract um, terms are fixed, we're building a relationship with a superb team um, that we wish to have with us over a very long period of time. And we're able to get real cost data to go into our um, uh, uh, our plans. So that helps us. Uh, and then the other thing we're finding, scavenging like all juniors should do in these circumstances, we're finding that actually the secondhand market uh, for critical mining equipment um, to get us moving is also pretty active right now. Because, again, people are, st are getting starved of capital and they're laying things off and things aren't working and so on and so forth. So what you should see, which is what we presented to the market, is a low, low capex, accurate but rapid restart. And the thing you'll all be watching for anyone interested in bunker is what is that final capex number? Well, again, I'm not going to I'm not going to um, uh, break any rules or, or upset my technical team by letting you know right now. Uh, but you'll be seeing it fairly soon. And again, given that we're leveraging off all of that sunk cost, you should expect it to be nice and low, which is what we're working towards. Again, Rick has those advantages, too. All right. Well, thank you. So, Rick, how about if you jump in and uh, give us some of your thoughts on uh on um, risks to uh, your operations, um, potential recession, as we've discussed, and how it may affect sort of ramping up and expansion uh, going forward. Yeah, I don't, I think, I mean, this is such a high grade deposit uh, that we have at Mancho, it's eight grams per ton. We're doing very simple things at the, at the Mancho site. We're, we're mining and we're controlling water on top of a hill so we don't have a lot of water to to worry about just what falls in our head so we put it in the trucks it goes up to the mill it gets processed um i say the uh, the price of fuel is our our biggest 
um, uh, concern in terms of, you know, if we have a hundred dollar barrel oil, uh, we'll have, you know, five or six dollar bar- uh, a, a gallon diesel. If we've got two hundred dollar a barrel oil, obviously it's, it's going to go up and it's a significant amount of our of our uh, of our costs. Uh, the, the road trip, uh, the truck travel up to the to the Fort Knox mill. So, um, you know, that's something we're obviously going to uh, keep a close eye on. Um, Kinross has buying power uh, because they buy a lot of fuel. So, you know, I think we'll we'll be able to take advantage of uh, take advantage of that. Um, I, so, I, you know, I don't see uh, I mean, we're using fifteen hundred dollar gold as as a base price. I think that's pretty conservative. Um, obviously, uh, the short story is we need to raise $50 million for 200, $250 million of free cash flow. So, uh, that's a pretty easy sell to, I, I think in any market, uh, to, to raise the, the, the capital that we need to do to get there. So, um, you know, do we have some things to do? Yes. Do I, am I, does it keep me up at night? Not really. Um, I think the price of fuel is probably the, the biggest one. Um, and and that's a big one for the whole mining industry. And and right now the the levers there are uh, are are uh, being controlled in part, at least by uh, by you know folks that you don't have a lot of trust in Russia, Saudi Arabia. I mean uh, Iraq. I mean the list goes on, right? Um, and and it's frustrating to watch this administration not allow the United States and 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 also Canada, its neighbor. <laughs> To produce more uh, oil and gas, it's just it's just uh, doesn't add up. Okay, thanks. Um, so, unfortunately, we can't get to everybody's questions. We do. Uh, I do have one thing I'd like to get uh, everybody's quick thoughts on. Um, what we? How would you approach this sector over the next three to six months, and where might we be in a year? Um, Rich, how about if we go with you first? As an investor, uh, again, I'd, I'd look for um, the essential metals um, or precious metals, both of those, strip it out uh, in those bases, and then narrow it down to the jurisdictions that you feel can provide the, the, the lowest cost green, ideally, energy, um, uh, work to assets that are either in production or near production, um, and then understand the, the the base, the structural cost base of each to see yeah. how um, uh, how robust they are and, and look, therefore, for significant value. You've got some great investment opportunities that we'd obviously say that we are one of those, uh, as Rick would say, and quite rightly so. Uh, he's just outlined that. Um, but there are many others, too. So uh, it's a good place to go. OK, thank you, Rick. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's always always about quality, and it's the quality of the assets, it's the quality of management, uh, and you know, I think all you can look to there is their track record. What have they? Uh, how have they? Uh, how they've performed as a team, and uh, what have they been able to accomplish? And everybody can make money when everything's going great, um, uh, but it's when it, when it, when things are tough, it's it, that's when you really sort of. Uh, Separate out good management from mediocre management, and I think uh, uh, that's a that's a bit of a long process because, uh, as, as we've all talked about, this isn't a, uh, this isn't a day trade type of a business, uh, especially the junior exploration piece of it. Um, so, you know, just I think investors need to sort of keep that in mind and, and uh, think about where they want to be in a year's time. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Just a, a minute or so, if you could give us your thoughts on how um, uh, investors should approach uh, this sector over the next three to six months. Absolutely. I think that there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of companies are dramatically undervalued relative to the underlying assets, to the teams and to the projects themselves. And so with that regard, what I would do is look at the companies that you think have a very strong macro conviction that aligns with yours. See where you think the world is going on the time horizon that you think it's going to get there and treat it very much like a puzzle, where it's about putting the appropriate companies and the appropriate dollar amount of investment relative to your conviction that the world is indeed gonna get there. I always like to think when it comes to investing that the world is a bit like a slow moving ship, which is it's very obvious to see where it's gonna go, but it takes a remarkably long amount of time to get there, longer than you'd expect. And the challenge in these circumstances is remaining solvent longer than markets can remain rational or irrational. And so to that extent, think around what capital do you need? 
in terms from a liquid perspective. What capital are you treating as generational? And how do you want to think about the risk around that generational capital? Naturally, juniors can provide a remarkably greater asymmetrical upside than a major. But the upside, I would argue, is probably far more likely in the context of a major than a junior, just if you average it along those cohorts. And so thinking in terms of your portfolio composition, as well as your personal risk tolerance. For me, as someone that's relatively young in my mining career, I'm very bullish on the juniors because I see the greatest upside in that category. And so think through your personal objectives and within that lens, make the appropriate decision that way. Thank you, Daniel. That's a, a great way to, uh, to, to top things off. Uh, you got the last word. Um, I, there are a couple of questions that are still outstanding. I'd like to invite uh, Rick and Rich, if you uh, can take a little bit of time to, to look at those and perhaps uh, reply to those. Otherwise, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for attending. Um, I think we certainly covered a lot of ground and uh, got some great uh, outlook and, and thoughts um, on the sector, but also on where perhaps the world is going uh, generally, both uh, in terms of economy, energy, mining, et cetera. And hopefully we can uh, circle back in, um, in a few months and revisit uh, some of this discussion. Again, I'd like to thank everyone for attending and uh, we hope to see you again soon. Mm -hmm.